Before we begin the video, I want to thank my subscribers once again. Because now, I have now reached to 100 subscribers. Again, not 1k, but still glad I reached that milestone. And also another thing, that I have a new computer set now, which is the Intel Z590 Core i7. All thanks to some of the most important people I know of. Which I am not going to name them, because I wanted to keep it as a secret and personal. Still thankful for getting this new set, since it was pretty expensive to get. And since now, I'm going to start making videos in this new computer, including this video that you're watching right now. So with that said, let's begin the video. The next game is a puzzle game that was part of a puzzle craze at its peak and was published by a formal game publisher back in the 90s and that's game number 27, Zoop, a multi-console game released throughout the 4th and 5th generation consoles. Published by Viacom New Media and developed by Hookstone Productions. The main goal of the game is to eliminate the colored pieces and cannot reach the playfield that you're on by matching a colored piece you have. It is an endless real-time puzzle game which at first starts out easy enough but gets harder once you advance to the harder levels. If you don't get rid of the pieces fast enough, the pieces will be on the playfield and bounces the main piece and get you a game over. All you need to do is how long can you last and how much score you get to receive your very own high score on the game. What do you expect? It's an endless puzzle game, not a story driven one. Its history all started back from a giant media company formerly known as Viacom Inc. To put it shortly, their debut began back in March 16, 1952 by its formal founder, Ralph Baruch. They started out as a broadcast syndication division of the CBS television network, but spawned off to form its own company in 1971. At the time, they were a distributor of CBS television series throughout the 1970s and 1980s, and also distributed syndicated television programs. They also managed to buy full ownership of Showtime and MTV Networks in 1985 and acquired Paramount Communications in 1994. By the mid-90s, they became a media conglomerate, owning a lot of different medias, not just television networks like MTV, Showtime, UPN, and Nickelodeon, but also film productions like Paramount Pictures and Republic Pictures, radio stations like KYSR and KDIA, music records like Nick Records, and even, at one point in time, a rental service for home movies and video games like Blockbuster Video. However, the only media that Viacom hasn't touched on was video games. Since during in the 90s, video games were starting to grow in popularity during that decade. So, Viacom decided that they wanted that piece of that gaming pie and thus create a video game distribution located in Chicago, Illinois that debuted in 1994 called Viacom New Media. Formed by two industry giants, Summer M. Redstone and Frank J. Biondi Jr. This division was to produce CD-ROM and cartridges titles for either home computers and home consoles. 
while most of them are based on existing properties from Nickelodeon and MTV like Nickelodeon Guts, Rocco's Modern Day, Spunky's Dangerous Stay, Ah Real Monsters, and Beavis and Butthead. But they did come out with something original, with the first one being Dracula Unleashed developed by ICOM Simulations and was released in 1993 for MS-DOS, Macintosh, Sega CD, and shockingly, DVD, which that was released in 2002, but wasn't published by them. However, their next original idea was to have their own original puzzle game. Because, during that time, there was a puzzle craze that was popular back in the late 80s to mid 90s. Thanks to a game that started it all being Tetris. So Viacom New Media wanted to have their own Tetris and wanted to replicate it but have their own spin on it. Thus getting one of their development studios, Hookstone Productions, to work on the game. The people who worked on it was director Jim Hansen, producer I. Kenneth Miller, designer Jason McGann, programmer John Rocky, artists Ian J. Bowden, Malcolm Cooper, Peter Tattersall, and composers Bob Scamassi, Mark Davis, and Brian L. Schmidt. Though the last part that I mentioned wasn't involved with the PS1 port, just to mention it anyways. The development for the game lasted for a year, starting back in 1994 and finishing it all the way up to 1995. Though, despite being finished, it was actually very hard to develop the game in that short of time since the team from Hookstone Productions stated in an interview with Spanish magazine PC Media that Zoop spent various years under development and that the concept initially proved to be difficult to explain for their producers and as such. Before Zoop was one month away from release, it was one of four games played in the preliminary rounds of the Blockbuster World Video Game Championship 2 competition. A rare instance of a as yet unreleased game being used in a video game competition, with the other three being Donkey Kong Country, Kirby's Avalanche, and NBA Live 95. When it was time to release the game, Viacom New Media marketed the game for some attention on numerous commercials and magazine promos with the slogan saying, America's largest killer of time. When it was first released on the Sega Genesis in June 1st, 1995, it received some decent reviews, with two reviewers discussing the Genesis port. First was Sega Magazine, but later renamed to Sega Saturn Magazine, gave the Genesis slash Mega Drive version a 62%, saying the game has the curious compulsiveness of Tetris to a degree, but that it was overshadowed by more complex and graphically impressive games than on the market. And the second one, by nickname CoverGirl from GamePro, was pleased with the music and graphics, particularly the use of eye-tricking background contrasts in the latter levels. She found the level select and 5 difficulty modes broadened the accessibility, but criticized that the game sends the player back to the beginning whenever they lose. She then concluded that while falling short of classics like Tetris, Zoop is an enjoyable enough puzzler to merit a buy. After that, many other ports were released from 1995 to 1996, like Super NES, MS-DOS, Macintosh, Game Boy, Game Gear, Saturn, Japan only, and to no one's surprise, PlayStation. The game is identical to the rest of the ports, but the only major differences aside from different graphical visuals is the removal of extra graphics, 
because Viacom requested the developer to disable the extra graphics to make the latter version more appealing than the formal version and also an animation when the piece bounces the main piece. When the PlayStation port was released in North America in November 20th, 1995, and Japan in November 22nd, 1996, which marks this as the very first North American game to not get a European release, it received some mixed reception upon its release. Though some reviewers did give out some decent reviews for the port, like GamePro giving a brief review of the PlayStation version and called it an uncomplicated puzzle game that's only slightly hampered by squirrely controls and a great addiction for puzzle fans. Another reviewer from Next Generation commented action puzzle games should be simple but addicting. Zoop is complicated, but kind of compulsive. And finally, IGN rated the PlayStation version of the game a 5 out of 10, stating, Zoop has all the makings of a good puzzle game, it just doesn't deliver the goods. Though, despite the port as well as the rest of the ports didn't become a massive success Viacom had hoped for, however, it did manage to feature one of these ports in an episode of a British TV series called Games Master. Which is about the video game challenges where the game players would compete against one another for the title of Games Master Champion. Which the show originally aired from 1992 to 1998, but then revived it in 2021, which is still currently running to this day as of 2021. However, the game showing it was not part of a challenge, but was just shown as an upcoming game demo in the review parts of the show. At least they did give it some screen time, despite giving it about 16 seconds. So now that I talked about its history, does this PlayStation port hold up today? Well, let's have a look at it in the review right now. The graphics are good, like the backgrounds, pieces, visuals, and animations. And that's really much it. Sorry, but I have nothing to say about the graphics, but just good overall in this segment. The presentation is also good. In the game, it shows the points in the upper left, the elimination count of the pieces in the upper right, and what stage you're on on the bottom right. All of them have a generic font, but passable, since it does fit the tone of the game, at least in my subjective opinion. The backgrounds all have some sort of a unique colors and textures to it, and feel like you moved on to the next stage. And it's like that for the first 9 stages, because after stage 9, they stop switching backgrounds and just stick to the sky background for the rest of the stages for eternity. Though it may be a cop out, but does make a lot of sense, since again, it is an endless puzzle game and trying to make very unique different backgrounds for every single stage is, is hard to make. So I could at least see why they didn't do that. Finally, the pieces do have some nice smooth animation to it, either moving to the center, matching the pieces when they fly off the screen, or all the pieces fly off the screen once you enter the next stage. And that's pretty much it for this segment as well. At least I had something little to say about this segment compared to the previous segment. The music is really good and well done for a puzzle game. It has this simple techno beat, but does have some catchy beats, which I really enjoy a lot. 
like the relaxed slash jazzy tone to the main menu, the fast paced beat from stages 3 to 4, the techno sounds from stages 7 to 8, or the different beeping effects mixed with techno in the name entry. The music for this port as well as the Saturn version was done by a New Zealand musical group called Unito Hi-Fi, which fun fact, one of the songs from the game which it's called Stag Kadori Dreams was from one of their studio album Wickedness Increased. As for the music for the game, they did a very good job on the soundtrack with very upbeat tones and perfect to listen to at nightclubs and house parties. Good work Unitone High Five. And finally, the gameplay. The controls feel a bit sensitive and a bit slippery at times, like even moving the player piece once, it still feels like you're moving sensitive. The layout of the action buttons is all the same by just tapping either square, triangle, circle, or axe. Though very weird that when it's in the pointing view from the up and down, the triangle and axe are their own as aiming, and the pointing view from the left to right, the square and circle are also their own aiming. It's very confusing saying these words. But that's really much I have to say about the controls. As for the game itself, it plays decent enough. You must eliminate the colored pieces by matching the colors you have at the moment. You can change the color by hitting a different colored piece in order to match the other colored pieces. There are also power-ups, which there are four in the game. First is the Proximity Bomb, which eliminates all the pieces by touching the first piece hit. Second is the Line Bomb, which eliminates the entire row or column of pieces regardless of color. Third is the Color Bomb, which eliminates all the pieces in a quadrant that are the same color as the first piece hit. And finally is the Bonus Springs. All you need to do is collect all five of them, and it would instantly eliminate the entire pieces off the grid. However, it's very hard to get five spring pieces once the difficulty kicks in into overdrive. And that is the next thing to talk about. The game is hard as balls. The earlier stages are a bit easy at first, However, it is short-lived because once you either enter stage 4 or 5, the difficulty kicks up a notch by making the pieces moving much faster and the elimination count are much higher up, making it too difficult for the casual players at times. Though it does make sense because puzzle games usually starts out easy but cranks it too hard once you keep playing it. And this, in particularly, is no exception to the puzzle formula. For me, playing this game is extremely difficult to play and easily lose once I entered stage 4. Yeah, as you can tell, I'm pretty bad at puzzle games. However, there is a stage and difficulty options in the settings. Here, you can pick a stage, but only the first 9 stages, and what difficulty you want to start. Like entering stage 9 with the easy difficulty, because you want to see the rest of the stages and don't want to start from the beginning again. Though, may be disappointed that, again, they stop changing backgrounds after stage 9. And finally, my thoughts and experience on the game. Well, it's okay. I do like the background changes and getting the power-ups for getting rid of the pieces, but it's kind of short-lived once I've seen everything what the game has to offer, and presentation-wise, of course. And knowing that the game never ends, it's highly likely that the game has no completion to it. But just racking how long you can go to get high scores. That doesn't mean the game isn't bad, I found it to be a little bit enjoyable in the earlier stages, 
it's just playing the game all by yourself feels a bit empty at times. And what's worse, that there is no multiplayer mode, which is just baffling. Because most puzzle games are usually great with multiplayer mode. And not having it in the game just feels lifeless. Not just this port, but almost all of the ports. Except for the Game Boy by using a Game Link cable. And that's about it for the review. Now, on to the conclusion. The game is okay, but a bit boring. It has some decent graphics, a good presentation like the backgrounds and animations, and a great techno beat soundtrack, but the gameplay is when it falters and some setbacks of being a good puzzle game. Like the difficulty comes up way too fast in the games starting in stage 4, having no unique backgrounds after stage 9, and of course, no multiplayer mode, which kind of sucks the fun factor and replayability. Though it may not be good to hardcore audience or puzzle players, but it may be good to some casual audience. And if it was made today, it would have been on mobile phones. Why mobile? Because playing this game didn't feel like a retail game, but it feels more that I'm playing a phone port, but ported to home consoles. Though it was completely impossible, since mobile gaming didn't exist until a decade later. And honestly, it would have been a perfect match for it. Just push the difficulty to stage 10 and voila, it would have been a decent game on phones. But if that's the case, why they didn't do that decades later? Well, it's because a year later, after the release of Zoop, Viacom New Media closed down their distribution somewhere in late 1996 due to their games not being huge successes as they once thought and was sold to Virgin Interactive in 1997, a year later, thus losing the rights to Zoop. There were some plans to bring back the property, but in September 2003, the trademark renewal for Zoop was cancelled, thus killing any chances for a revival, and that's a shame, because despite being okay, I would have seen what could have happened to it if the property was revived. Like making sequels that would have improved the game, and having some unique quirks to it. But sadly, we may never know. As for Viacom, they still continued on with their successes with their movies and TV shows, and also merging back with CBS in 2019, forming now known as Viacom CBS. And also infamously giving takedowns to content creators despite fair use for reviews and YTPs. Which just hit me. Am I going to get a takedown since I'm using one of their formal properties? Nah, I doubt it. I mean, that will never happen, because they lost the rights to it almost two and a half decades ago, and it's not like they don't care about it, right? 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 Uh, however, this isn't the end for Viacom New Media, we still have two more games to come across, which is The Divide, Enemies Within, and Slamscape, both released in 1996 for Windows and especially PlayStation, which both will be discussed separately in the future. Now, with everything that I said about this endless puzzle game, I give my official rating a 3 out of 6. Next time on the PlayStation era, I'm going to be talking about Lemmings 3D, or 3D Lemmings, which is called in the rest of the world, but still called 3D Lemmings in the spine for some odd reason, but whoops anyways, 
which is the first 3D entry to the Lemmings series, the fourth Psygnosis game and one of their flagship series for the North American PlayStation, and also compatible with the PlayStation Mouse, since it is based on another PC port after all. Thanks for watching.